Well, hello. I'm going to welcome everyone today here on behalf of the Greenwell Conservancy and Hawaii Island Recovery um, to our talk on um, addictions, change, and the risks of growing phobia. The risks of growing phobia. Um, I'm dedicating this talk to Kathleen Martin because this really is much of her conceptualization. She's really done a great deal of, of, of really trying to conceptualize the idea that psychotherapy can have an unintended consequence, a side effect of growing phobia. And we're going to talk today about how, how we think that is and things we can do to offset that so that doesn't happen. Other ways we've looked at this in the past is dealing with resistance. We've, we've called it that, dealing with resistance. Okay. So we're going to start with somebody like Pierre Jeannet. Uh, student of Freud, along with Jung and others, um, Pierre Genet looked at um, psyche as um, managing it to regulate itself through higher or what he called lower orders of diversions. It was a way in which we would, you know, in a healthy way, manage our internal energy and express our internal social relations and energy through higher order, healthy diversions, exercise, these kinds of things, you know, religious activities, um, things that, you know, recreation and so on, love, work, and play. Or conversely, we would develop what he called lower order um, diversions, and these we call substitute actions or addictions. And what, in, a, in, a, in the case of a lower order diversion or a substitute action or an addiction, we're using a substance to regulate our nervous system in lieu of the ability to, to either do some healthy means or some self-regulatory ability, we've developed a relationship with a substance or a thing, some object or a substance, to, um, or an action of a lower order to regulate and discharge the energy of, of our nervous system and keep ourselves kind of on a regulating state. We might say often in addictions, in other words, um, addictions organize our lives. Isn't that what we say? Drugs organize our lives up to a certain point until they come apart. But the life is built for or around the substance. So in that way, it's organizing the life. It's keeping a certain pattern. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, during withdrawal, addiction huh, is defined, and we're, we're calling addiction is defined as a primary relationship, primary relationship with negative consequences. So during withdrawal, and the clients that we might see here at Hawaii Island Recovery, they are in a relationship crisis, a big one. Their primary relationships are being threatened. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, that's an attachment disruption by any, by any other terms, a big attachment disruption. And there's all kinds of makeup, breakup, ambivalence. All kinds. Makeup, breakup, ambivalence. Dysregulation occurs. There's a threat to the homeostasis or phobia. A threat to homeostasis or phobia, fear. And it's a crisis of opportunity if grasped. If grasped. But there is fear. I mean, you, you, you know, not only, not only do most of, our, um, most of our clients come from backgrounds where their attachment was less than ideal, which would predispose them to a substance as a primary attachment and as a regulator. We know in attachment where there is healthy attachment that the brain in the, in, in the individual develops an ability to, to idle, to calm down, what we call the brain's default mode network. That part of the brain is actually trained in healthy attachment. Infant, infant mother, parent, mother, dyads, eye contact, softness of voice, regularity of contact develops that part of the brain, Ruth Linnaeus talks about it, and some of Peter Fonagy's research on infant mother dyads, have been able to actually demonstrate that certain either um, uh, effective eye contact and or lack of it, certain types of voice, soft voice, prosody voice, gentle voice, soft, higher frequency, communicates to the brain that the world's okay, then literally that part of the brain develops up to the age of possibly 12. That continues to develop, actually. And the result of healthy attachment is that when the individual stops focusing on something, the brain idles to a default mode of calm. 
in lieu of that healthy attachment, the brain stays at whatever action mode it's in. And it doesn't idle automatically, and therefore the individual is not able to internally shift states. They can't change their own states. So they become dependent on externals to change their internal states. So they become highly manipulative, they get involved in lots of social drama, uh, prone to drugs, uh, alcohol, drugs, substances, to manage those states. So that ability to die, you know, calm down and idle, self-regulate, we use the word self-soothe. The self-soothing ability is not built in. Okay. And we know there's many different styles of attachment. I'm not going to explore those right now, but briefly we have, or, you know, we can talk about organized, disorganized, ambivalent, insecure, dismissive, um, preoccupied, we can call those quickly. And, and so the parental style of attachment programs the child's style of attachment. And we need to know that in working with our clients, one, to see what that baseline was, and now we know they're in the midst of a major attachment crisis. They're losing a primary regulating relationship that has organized their lives. <clears throat> so what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at um, Kathy Martin's handout, um, Introduction to Structural Dissociation Theory, which is really right out of Pierre Genet. This comes from The Haunted Self. Um, uh, this comes from uh, Neil House. Steele and Vander Hart, Vander Hart, Neilhaus, and Steele's, their sort of foundational book, The Haunted Self. And what Pierre Genet said was that the, um, in the healthy person, if you look on the right, um, or on the left, the healthy person, the pre-trauma person who's pre-trauma mental health, the, um, the, the part of themselves that, that manages their life, their manager, if you wish, um, that manages everyday living is integrated with the defensive system. There's a natural integration. They flow in and out of each other. If something happens, it's, a, it's responded to and adapted to right in here in real time. There's no delay. It's a, It seems like a natural response to whatever's going on while the person's able to continue managing. But as trauma begins to take place, the material, the traumatic material disturbs the ability to stay focused and manage our everyday action systems. We become preoccupied with the disturbance. So in order to still function, part of ourselves turns away from the traumatic memory and it focuses instead on trying to stay here and now put what, one foot in front of the other. And a repeated pattern of turning away from the traumatic material, avoiding it, and attempting to stay focused on the here and now inevitably causes a split between the defensive system and the everyday management or action system. It creates an absolute split. And that, the, and that the, the, the severity of the trauma over time, persistent trauma, creates an absolute distance. And we call that structural dissociation of the personality. So there literally, there is a a time response awareness distance between the defensive system, the adaptive protective system, and the part of the person that is trying to manage the everyday living responsibilities. I like to use the analogy, it's like the little old lady who lived in a shoe with too many children, she didn't know what to do. Or old Mother Hubbard and all her cupboards, you know, everything is all put away. You know, and don't shake the cupboards. Okay. And you'll see that it's almost an obsessive, controlling, uh, a concrete, preoccupied way of managing survival. And the person is, in fact, in a survival mode. Mm -hmm. They're not living anymore. They're surviving. And everything's about survival. And you'll see hypervigilance, hypervigilant response to things when there's that dissociative aspect. And Janae called that the apparently normal part of the personality. And he used that term, it was an old term, because he was studying shell-shocked um, victims of the war. And they could, you know, they could wander right into, uh, you know, into a town after a shell-shocked event. They wouldn't know who they were. They wouldn't know where they came from. They wouldn't know anything about themselves. But they could step right into, you know, uh, working on a farm and help out and function very apparently normally. They could do all the everyday living tasks. But they couldn't tell you who they were and or what happened to them. But they looked apparently normal. And they and so it's it's sort of that part of ourselves that, you know, 
something terrible happens, but oh no, we get right back into normal functioning. And I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm handling it. I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm fine. Yeah, well, okay. Until you go home and spend a few moments by yourself. Then all of a sudden the flashbacks and the intrusions, the defensive system starts to come back in again. And we might define the defensive system as those amygdala functions of fight, flight, freeze, attachment cry, collapse, and withdrawal and attempt to licking one's wounds and recover from, from, from a traumatic event. Autonomic responses. That's our defensive system. So those autonomic responses are separated from that action system that's trying to manage everyday living. And so what happens is the memories of the traumatic events become dissociated, they become compartmentalized in, and held in the defensive system. And we call those the emotional parts of the personality. That's, those are Janae's terms for it. I mean, you know, we can translate that into EMDR terms and we call those memory channels. Okay, be that as it may. Okay. But we personify it in, J in Janae's way of looking at it. And we call them emotional parts of the personalities. And the degree to which these parts of the personality have developed a sense, separate sense of self, that is the degree of the severity of the structural dissociation. It's defined by the degree it has a separate sense of self. So if we have all these traumatic memories that have been, you know, very much like the, you know, the immune system, you know, when an invader comes in, the immune system wraps around those invaders and attempts to, you know, compartmentalize them from the, you know, the organism. Well, our brain's doing the same thing with the traumatic memory. It's compartmentalizing and taking it out of awareness. So what happens is, is that uh, old Mother Hubbard in there, or the little old lady and lived in the shoe, that apparently normal part, is, it loses awareness of, of that material. And when it starts to come into awareness, uh, is really afraid that it's going to disrupt the action system. It's afraid. It's that, you know, as a client of mine described, you know, I'm afraid my peas won't stay quarantined on the plate. <laughs> all that emotional material will start to roll into the kitchen. It's like having all the kids suddenly underfoot. Or what we in structural dissociation in the ego state call these exiled aspects of the self are going to start coming in to the operating system. And it doesn't make much sense from a safety point of view to have all those aspects underfoot in the kitchen. So that part of self becomes quite obsessive and phobic of the material. Phobic and or loathing or both may have developed a downright loathing of that weak, sniveling, disgusting, you know, part of myself that I don't like, or real phobia, real phobia. So any attempt to access that material in any shape or form without the explicit understanding, explicit engagement and enjoyment of that manager <laughs> will result in an increased reaction from the defensive system. This is why in things like EMDR or any kind of therapy, narrative or anything, the client comes into your assessment, you know, and starts automatically just sort of unloading the entire history of their trauma, and then they go home and flip out and don't come back to therapy again. All the P's got unquarantined very quickly, and that A and P stepped right back in there and said, oh, God, never again. What did I do? I'm not going back to that therapist again. Look what they did to me. Okay. So, you know, slowing people down when they're, it's coming out too fast... <laughs> or engaging the proper informed consent psychologically to enter the defensive system. And we have a unique even and far more complex um, situation on our hands because the person is now in a make-up breakup crisis, as well as having all that traumatic material that's stored in there. That AMP is now trying to go, oh, my God, how am I going to manage? You know, well, I, I'm going to stay sober. I, I'm going to follow this program. I, I, I've got that to do, too, on top of, you know, uh, well, what am I going to do when I go home? How will I manage? I'm gonna, well, what is this going to look like? Are they telling me to live one day at a time? I'm not making it five minutes at a time right now. You know, that AMP is pretty freaked out. It's really freaked out. That's the real bottom line. It's scared to death. So, well, there, there, there's our challenge then, you know.
And again, just for a little more information on structural dissociation theory, I'm not going to go too much farther with this, but um, where there's really early, profound, and severe persistent trauma, primarily by using primary caregivers, you might have one or more of those AMPs with a emotional part sort of circling around and being managed by them. So you've got several mother hubbards running the show. And we call that, you know, um, DID. You know, we used to call it multiple personality disorder.